Hello and welcome to 19th lecture of course on corrosion, environmental degradation and surface engineering. This lecture is on a non destructive testing and it is a third part of this lecture or uh, this topic. We have already covered uh, visual uh, observation or visual inspection, visual testing. We have done also the ultrasonic testing. We have done radiographic, uh, radiography testing and uh, we will not be covering magnetic particle testing and liquid penetration testing in detail. So, this uh, you can see the left hand side uh, we will be just giving some sort of uh, main features of these two testing and we will be covering in this lecture eddy current testing and thermographic testing. Next lecture 20th lecture we will be covering the acoustic emission testing and stress strain DIC testing which is emerging technology or emerging testing procedure. So, we have covered a number of testing and I am, I am giving more and more uh, lectures on uh, non destructive testing reason being I believe that it is a future uh, where number of startups uh, can be started and uh, we, we really require many sensors, we really require very good algorithms to simulate the real environment and now the new words is coming digital twin. So, this kind of techniques will be very, very useful to correlate what is really happening in real situation and how to correlate with a damage or surface damage or surface degradation and really get a real performance. So, in one of my lecture earlier I mentioned that almost every design people do is a static design. They do not really look at the, all the uh, dynamic characteristic or time dependence characteristics in complete sense. While in digital twin we need to compare both the things maybe the what we have done earlier now what is really happening every day and then necessary modification should be made in a software design also. So, that we can take a proper care proper maintenance also. Now, coming to the these two techniques uh, MPT and LPT. So, what we are mentioning here to locate the surface or near surface faults in a material. If uh, and we want to use a magnetic particle test then it will be used mostly for the ferromagnetic material, non ferromagnetic material we will not be able to use this kind of uh, technology or magnetical particle technology. Another one is a liquid penetration test is basically done for the surface, subsurface we will have a some sort of doubts about this technology. So, now coming to the MPT the magnetic particle test what we use there we use the ferromagnetic materials. Uh, particles it can be iron it can be iron oxide however as per my knowledge if we use a pure iron then the results will be far better compared to the iron oxide and uh, because of the retainability and then um, uh, even the magnetic uh, field which will be generated with the uh, ferromagnetic particles. So, ferromagnetic particle we can use iron or iron oxide and they are being spread generally on object surface and magnetic field is generated. Now, magnetic field can be generated using permanent magnet or electromagnet. Now, what is the advantage with electromagnet that we can go ahead with a variable magnetic field also based on the current which is supplied to electromagnet we can generate a uh, variable field. So, electromagnetic will be a better option compared to the permanent magnet. Now, what is the really uh, the characteristics of this system? See whenever there is a fracture, whenever there is a crack there will be disruption of north south uh, lines. If there is only uh, only there are two poles and north pole and south pole on the whole system then this flux line will be well directed there will not be much problem. However, if that magnet breaks in a number of parts then there will be many north poles many south poles also and that disturbs a complete magnetic field as such. And we try to figure out is there a magnetic disturbance in a magnetic field or not. So, that is why we say magnetic field line will get disturbed if there is a defect or crack near the surface. Even just below the surface if there is a crack naturally there will be some sort of a north south lines flux line will be disturbed or maybe the, the uh, it will not be following the normal on the path as such. Now, uh, um, because there are too many north poles, uh, north and south poles, what will happen? The particles 
will be clustered around those spots only wherever the these lines are merging with each other then the, the this particle will get assembled over there and that is indication there is a some crack there is a some defect there is a some discontinuity and flux line is not getting continuous path and that is what is written that where the flux like uh, when the flux like uh, magnetic flux will leak and uh, it will generally happen the cracks and defects and which will leave the really traces or the reveal the show the traces what are the really what kind of defects are there again we will not have a 100 percent quantification is kind of a qualitative measures we will be able to find out what are the problems, but what is the exact size of the crack we may not be able to find the results as such. Now, coming to the, on the LPT, LPT the liquid uh, penetrant uh, test generally is done on the non uh, porous materials non porous materials almost all the materials are non porous however uh, in this uh, the recent time there is a some research on the porous materials also. So, this LPT will not be able to you will not be able to utilize for that. So, we say the metals ceramics plastic uh, will be better option in the situation. So, whenever there is a, uh, and a non porous material and I was uh, I am uh, assuming most of the materials are non porous like a metals are non porous ceramics and plastic. However, more and more research is also happening on the porous material to reduce the density of the materials. However, we are just trying that the LPT will be restricted to the non porous material and uh, this reason is uh, if there is a non porous material and there is a some sort of uh, surface breaking what will happen because of the capillary action the liquid will penetrate into the surface and that is the capillary action will uh, be uh, in the, in the main part in this situation. So, kind of the penetrant which we are liquid penetrant which we are using the properties of the liquid will be very useful. Now, if the liquid penetrate is applied to the surface and we will leave it for the some time. So, that it can really penetrate into crack or pits using the as I mentioned the capillary action. After that when so maybe after some soaking time we will be using the developer and what is the developer white uh, developer is a white powder which is sprayed on that liquid and then uh, it will uh, really enter or maybe get attached to the liquid and then uh, will be able to give a trace that there is a some uh, the, the crevices or maybe some sort of pit available again these are the qualitative information not a complete depth of the crack will be known to us there is a crack there is a some sort of capillary action happening that information will come to us. So, we need to rectify. So, these are the basically qualitative tests quantification may not be absolutely possible using this kind of uh, test. However, experience matters a lot people who have been utilizing this kind of test they can really predict a lot about this, but here the skill will play major role compared to the, uh, the test procedure or the testing method in the situation. So, that is why we do not want to go beyond this because uh, uh, there are many new techniques which have emerged uh, over the time we will be covering those as I mentioned in this lecture we will be focusing more on uh, eddy current testing and thermographic testing. So, let us uh, start first test of the eddy current testing again this uh, there are number of sensors available and um, uh, 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 available in a market or maybe say in a company with the companies which they use uh, eddy current sensors and eddy current sensor is a basic, basic problem or maybe the basic advantage or characteristic is that whenever we pass a current using the um, in electric uh, uh, we say the coil then what will happen the magnetic field will get generated and that magnetic field will give us some sort of results to us. So, that is what we are saying that eddy current testing basically is utilized or we will be utilized to evaluate or spot the defects. Now, what is the constraint what is the restriction is a conductive material if the material conductivity is not very good then eddy current will not be able to give results to us. So, one constraint is that if the materials are a conductive material eddy current testing can be utilized on that and even we will be able to find the uh, crack even up to depth up to 10 mm. I am using the word uh, 10 mm is basically for aluminum alloy, but as a material changes this depth will vary and uh, we really require good simulation good testing on uh, the, 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 the modeling. So, that we can get a good results on that. Now, uh, let us me explain this uh, complete principle we say the magnetic field is produced around a coil or sometime we use the word prop the, the, the coil is inbuilt in the, in the probe itself. So, we can use a coil or we can use a probe and then uh, often people use a uh, uh, alternative current AC current 
uh, through it. However, in these states now the some tests are available with the DC current, some uh, people are using the pulse uh, current. So, the different kind of currents can be used every current will produce a magnetic field and if we have a good characterization of those uh, currents and the magnetic field or maybe good relation is established, we can uh, utilize any kind of the current. So, whichever is a favorable which is a for our uh, post processing and which will give a good results to us. So, in this case what we are in the, the as we are mentioning a generalized case, in generalized case AC is most commonly used uh, alternative current which is um, in the pass through the coil and that current will uh, generate uh, the, the magnetic field uh, and then it can be uh, in the when the magnetic field it is generated and it is brought to the material which is electrically conductive. So, what will happen electrically conductive material will try to oppose that magnetic field and in opposition it will generate eddy currents and that is a what we want to know what kind of eddy currents are getting generated and it will depend on number of parameters and then if we have a depth of the knowledge about those parameters we can do a good simulation, we can do good estimation also. So, what we can say this coil creates eddy current within a material which being investigated whatever material we are trying to investigate and then it will uh, that this eddy currents are generated when we are bringing uh, this coil near to the conductive surface. Now, uh, as I mentioned depends on the many parameters like material properties will be a major issue then what kind of electric uh, current we are giving and then what kind of the frequency we are giving to the coil or maybe the, the current coil and then the frequency it will really affect our results too or maybe say overall results. So, this is a what we um, say the eddy current generally will be generated. Uh, mostly they follow a continuous path and there is a discontinuous path again we will be able to say there is a some fault in that. So, this is what mentioned here the defects difference in a conductivity and material geometry. So, there are many parameters defect is a one parameter change in the conductivity is another parameter change in the conductivity basically is comes when the material is getting corroded and whenever there is a corrosion layers are come keep coming on the surface naturally its conductivity will vary and we can estimate that also. So, if I know the aluminum conductivity and then I know that something is uh, maybe I am using aluminum, I am using the same sensor and then it is well is calibrated, but this is continuously changing some uh, multi layers are keep coming on the surface or if the, the material is getting removed also then we will know that there is a maybe the gap is increasing maybe there is a material removal rate uh, on a higher side and then we need to keep a check. So, in short we say that defect will disturb. Uh, change in the material conductivity if you are able to realize and even the geometry also it can be rectangular, it can be cylindrical naturally the geometry change in geometry will also disrupt the eddy currents and then if we are able to diagnose what is the disturbance in eddy currents that will help uh, to find out what is the overall problem with the system. This allows to detect the uh, uh, defects and anomalies uh, whatever the differences in a material by analyzing basic thing is that we need to know what is analysis, how eddy current are supposed to get generated and where there is a disruption and try to analyze why there is a disruption. Is it a because of defect? Is it the because of the corrosive layer? Is it a because of the removal of material? Is it a because of the change in the geometry? So, if we have a good understanding about these parameters we can really figure out what is happening to the surface degradation material degradation. Now, I mentioned very clearly the eddy current testing that is a short form we are writing eddy current testing ECT, ECT utilize AC current as I mentioned. Now, frequency can be anything from 1 kilohertz to megahertz, higher frequency will have a different current if your portions are very very thin. Uh, section are very thin then we will go with a high frequency, but if you record a uh, more depth of the eddy current then I will go for a lower frequency. So, that is why we say the eddy current uh, the frequency can be 1 kilohertz to 2, uh, 2 megahertz when it is from the flowing through the coil it will create a magnetic field around that. Now, lower frequency can travel in the material. So, the depth of penetration will be a higher side with a low frequency while higher frequencies are more attuned on the surface floor itself. So, that if I go for the higher frequency it is very suitable for the thin section because it will get attuned on the surface only or maybe the subsurface to some extent. So, depth of penetration will not be very high 
of course, uh, there will be upper limit, there is a lower limit and then we can calibrate according to that. Now, whatever the disturbance, I say the disturbance comes and then if we are able to uh, and, uh, judge it, so then we can say that uh, and the, the whatever the in terms of voltage, in terms of frequency, in terms of current, if we are able to uh, uh, get this as either through this using the same coil in which current has been passed or we can use a secondary coil also where the magnetic field is getting generated and we can detect that and we can interpret. Uh, the, the way we have mentioned our ultrasonic testing, we can have a two sensor uh, opposite side of the surfaces or the, the, or the maybe system or on the same side one sensor. So, it can and then the transmit the, uh, the waves and can receive also waves. So, in the similar kind of thing we can have a two coil or we can have a one coil also. If the one coil uh, that means it is sending and then receiving also the both the things are happening. Of course, it will be overall economics will be there, but naturally the control circuit needs to be very costly or maybe much more complicated compared to the two coils. So, this is uh, uh, the, the merits and demerits of single coil or double coils. Now, different company use a different kind of principles uh, then uh, depends on what is available resource and what we want to achieve whether cost is the main prior criteria or lesser complexity is the main criteria. We can choose uh, what kind of sensor will be useful to us. So, now this slide uh, shows a broad view of uh, uh, eddy current testing what has been shown uh, this is a some sort of electromagnet you are able to see these are the coils and then electromagnet and when we are passing a current AC current into this and we are able to see the blue color line these are the magnetic lines it can be north poles or south poles and then there is a continuous line there is no disturbance. Now, this is electrically conductive material when the coil comes near to that we are able to see this are the red color line on uh, the surface, so this is the eddy current uh, uh, which is getting generated there. Now, if there is any flaw uh, in, the, in the on the surface or on subsurface, there will be disruption in a generation of eddy current now that has been marked with the yellow color portion. So, that is why if we this, uh, this is the same thing has been written the what is the basic principle is induced in the when we send a current or induce a current into the coil it will generate a magnetic field and magnetic field had been shown in a blue color line in all three uh, electromagnet 1, 2 and 3 all three it has been shown with the blue color. When the coil is placed over the conductive material means the separation is not significantly high and this is very near to each other then what will happen there will be opposite alternating current will be generated and what we are using the word AD current and that has been shown in a red color this is the red color has been shown over here will be generated and finally, as I mentioned if there is a defect in the surface or in a on a surface or an under subsurface so maybe then the defects uh, will disturb the path of the ID current that has been shown in a orange color or yellow color and this disturbance can be measured by the coil and then calibrate and then maybe a different type of cracks will give a different result different type of the depth of the crack will be also revealed. So, it really require a lot of uh, data uh, good algorithm and to give the good results. So, that is why the when some students want to start a new company this is the one of the very hot area where the more and more sensors are required more and more non destructive testings are required. So, that we can really come up with a sustainable solution I am using the word sustainable solution if the component or system goes for the double life or triple life after 4 times life or maybe it does not cause any failure or the, uh, the even cause a failure, but it is not a catastrophic failure those kind of solutions are really required in the present time. If you are able to achieve using this kind of uh, the improvement in the sensors or improvement in technologies that will really you know, give a good uh, uh, kind of a company or good startup as such. So, that is why I am trying to elaborate on this. Now, uh, the three box are also there we say that eddy current uh, in a material with a greater, uh, greater conductivity uh, if the material conductivity is higher side we will get a better and better response of the generation of eddy currents and better and better performance uh, may be the better and better in the strength of the signal naturally the signal to noise ratio will be very high or in just opposite the noise to signal ratio will be very very low that is where the advantages come to us and that is why we want to use a more and more conductivity of material so that we get a better and better results. So, this is the word has been mentioned. However, flip side also mentioned that if we uh, if uh, eddy current generated by the low conducting material are weaker, so that we will not be able to get a good response. So, 
if I am changing the material, even I am changing the nano composite of the material, even I am using 0.1 percent of additional material, uh, maybe say even nano compos composite, the possibility is the electric conductivity may change, it may enhance, may decrease. But we really require a calibration constant for those material. That means whenever I choose a new material, I need to have a calibration constant that can, should be utilized with a device so that overall the results can be uh, estimated in an appropriate manner. So this is the calibration constant is important. Another side where we say that magnetic um, permeability also, materials magnetic permeability also will be important because it really uh, indicate what will be the uh, depth of eddy uh, currents travel. So, more and more depth uh, will be preferable to one extent and uh, we say that the, the, the travel of the eddy current will increase if the material uh, permeability is on a higher side. So, that should be done. Now, however, one uh, more constraint, one more problem comes at temperature. Increase in temperature will reduce the magnetic field and then depends on the uh, material whether thermal conductivity as a, uh, electric conductivity will increase or decrease. So, the, what you can say the temperature affects electrical conductivity and magnetic characteristics of the test material. So, that is why we really require a temperature compensation also. If temperature is going on a 55 degree and we have done a calibration on 30 degree then this should be compensated some either compensation constant or maybe recalibration will need to be done. So, these are the new things which are really required it is nothing like an NDT is something you pick up one setup and apply to some material and results will be uh, and then the very favorable no we require really understanding we, uh, we need to have a knowledge and that will give a good returns to us. Now, another one uh, as I am using the word lift up the factor that is a basically distance. So, what is the distance between the this, uh, this, uh, this uh, um, electromagnet and the surface? If the distance is much smaller naturally the strength of eddy current will be on a higher side and then distance is far away then eddy current generation will be lesser. So, this is also important. So, what we say the strength and interaction of eddy currents affect lift up factor that means the distance between the coil and surface of the test item. That means whenever we have a, another chart available or software we need to have some relation it can be linear relation it can be non-linear relation if it is a linear relation then we need to give a range ok maybe 1 mm to 2 mm this will be linear range something like that or from a point 1 mm to 1 mm there will be linear range. Otherwise, we need to use a non-linear relation, non-linear relation can be anything, it depends on the what kind of sensor we are using, what kind of electromagnet we are using. So, those the things are important. So, I am using the word now, we require a calibration constant, we require a temperature compensation. In addition, we really require a some sort of relation between eddy current and the uh, lift up uh, factor in this situation. So, these are important uh, aspects to really uh, and then the execute uh, eddy current testing research. Now, I, I mentioned something about the depth of penetration and then uh, there is a something like a current density or we say that uh, these are the factors. So, then, then there, there is some lit available literature in this I am just trying to highlight, but we say the eddy currents basically are the closed loop almost all the currents in this case they try to close the loop of. Uh, and then the, the, the because of the induced current circulating and then it the, the, this kind of uh, eddy currents are generally perpendicular to the flux line is the, the, that is what was shown in previous line. Another thing is the eddy currents are uh, uh, concentrated near surface adjacent to excitation coil and their, dist uh, their strength decreases uh, as a distance from the coil increases. So, um, a near coil or near electromagnet the eddy current uh, density current density will be on higher side but as the distance increases the uh, density will come down. Another thing we say that the eddy current density decreases exponentially with the depth. So, it is a non-linear relation uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier the linear or non-linear relation. Now, this is over here is uh, that uh, this uh, decrease in the current density will be exponential and that is why the mostly people say that uh, this eddy currents are skin effects 
However, as I mentioned, we are given one example in the aluminum, it can be the depth can be 10 mm also. So, however, when we think about the 10 mm, we need to have a nonlinear relation and need to have a proper software and then, uh, then only we can do the good test. Of course, it is applicable up to 10 mm, but it will not give the same effect on the 9 mm and 10 mm. So, we require a good relation, we really require a good mathematical formula or maybe some modeling to come up with that. So, uh, to the con come up with the right results. So, however, I am mentioning that the current uh, uh, density decreases exponentially with the depth and that is what we call as a skin effect. And uh, another one is that uh, uh, as I may uh, earlier mentioned the depth of penetration of eddy current will be depending on the frequency of excitation current. If excitation current uh, frequency is on higher side, uh, naturally the depth will be much lesser. So, it is a basically inverse relation or a reciprocal relation that has been shown here. You can see here this relation the depth is shown in, uh, in mm is inversely proportional or maybe the is a, um, the proportional to uh, square root of 1 over f, f here is a frequency. So, this is uh, what uh, some relation has been given uh, uh, just for the understanding purpose and then what is a D we say that uh, this D is a standard depth of penetration and uh, how do we find we say that in this is eddy current density has decreased to 37 percent uh, almost two third of the eddy current density has come down uh, and then that is that's what uh, we are using the uh, uh, distance D. This does not mean the eddy current stop at the that depth, it can go from, uh, beyond that also. However, current density will be very weak or maybe low uh, on the lesser side, and then uh, the reliability or maybe will be questionable in this case. So, however, there are four figures has been shown, but here we are showing the frequency. The low frequency 10 kilohertz, we are showing here that um, and this uh, D depth, which has been shown a black color line, and that has been indicated here that uh, one standard depth of penetration is black color and then there is a red color here. This has been shown the three standard depth and then uh, what we are showing this is the EC density. So, EC density has been shown with the big dot dots and black color dots and uh, frequency penetration has been shown with the blue color dot. You are able to see these are the blue, blue color dots as such and then these are going down. And then this is uh, what has been mentioned. Now, look at this one medium frequency 1 megahertz, the D is uh, above the surface. That means, this is a not a good option, this is also not a good option, this is also not a good option. So, it depends uh, on, a, on a material uh, and, and, and a kind of uh, even in this case, it can be distance also that we need to choose appropriate system uh, on the sensors and then material and that means, a material conductivity is lesser than we need to either place uh, electromagnet very near to surface or uh, maybe need require some sort of a, a, a good relation to predict the right results. And then here the mu has been shown with the relative permeability, uh, it has a relation also with a D, but uh, exact relation is not known it can be simulated, it can be modeled. However, there is a relation between D and relative permeability. Similarly, there is a relation between D and uh, electrical conductivity also and so that is needs to be understood and that need to be developed appropriately. I am um, just trying to uh, hide what are, the, what are the important parameters when we think about uh, in this. Uh, uh, and eddy current uh, based testing or the eddy current based non destructive testing. We will just take a couple of examples here. Uh, there is a one paper published in 2050, and what is the title of the paper? It says a 40 crack length sizing using the flexible eddy current sensor array. Now, in this case, what they say that we do not have to use only one sensor, reason because we need to scan the surface. And with the one sensor, we will not be able to get a very fast results, quick results and then manageable results as such. So, they use a kind of the array of sensor, it can be 64 uh, the sensor, it can be 100 sensors and the scan. And then the whenever there is a scanning of the sensor, that has been shown here, there are so many sensors or maybe 64 element has been shown. So, and then they print the circuit uh, on a one flexible strip, so that it can follow the contour of the surface also. And there is a very close proximity of uh, sensor and uh, sensor and the, and the geometry. So, the strength of the signal will be very good as such. 
even though we supply very minimum current to that uh, generate a very less magnetic field, but because approximate is very good it is almost attached to the surface signals will be very good and then uh, now because um, in the here they are using a multiple sensors naturally calibration will be required. So, they did a calibration also and then they did a some sort of simulation and that is what I have been shown. However, is the why they selected a number of sensors they found that the sensor arrays means multiple sensors which are connected with each other integrated with each other they outperform uh, compared to the single element sensor. Single element sensor which uh, was a common practice it will give a very uh, delayed signal and then uh, it, uh, uh, we need to disturb the geometry also and then uh, mostly those are not on the flexible strip. So, distance will be also lesser or will be on a hard side compared to the multiple uh, array system. And then uh, and they, uh, would they say that the, uh, the with the sensor array they are able to improve the efficiency. Uh, resolution and coverage area because coverage area is a more important for us it is on surface and the whole surface if we have a very miniature sensor naturally so they need to be scanned with the some speed and instead of that if you go with the multiple sensors and this as I say the multiple sensor is a basically a printed circuit it is not uh, an individual sensor hanging around and then we are trying to move from one surface to one place to other uh, place. So, that is what we this is eddy current uh, detects the subsurface cracks and corrosion and of course, uh, we are taking example of aluminum and I mentioned earlier up to uh, down to 10 mm depth uh, and the measurement can happen. If we choose the right frequency and we choose the right sensor suit the multiple sensor we select properly then we can do the we can get this kind of results and this kind of the results are more important. Uh, as I was mentioning about uh, the magnetic particle or liquid penetrant compared to that uh, this kind of uh, the eddy current testing will be much better or uh, provide much better results. So, that is why they are when they have now you been utilized for the welded junctions or welded structures and uh, we know then welded uh, structure there will be some sort of crack or crevices crack or maybe vertic cracks and that will be the damaging if we find the crack there will be need to bridge the crack or the fill the crack and that can be you know, understood using the this kind of sensors. Even in the sometime we when we think about the paints or the some uh, corrosive print bending coating also this uh, this kind of a testing can be done on that and then provide provide whether the there is a some sort of crack in a coating or the paint and that will create unnecessary some sort of a crevices and then there is a possibility of electrochemical cell formation which will damage or will cause a major damage on the corrosion side. So, that can also be detected well in advance. Now, coming to the simulation and experimental results what they did they they uh, need to really reproduce uh, then because we cannot do infinite experiments we can get understanding from experiments when again then we required a modeling and that is what they did a modeling and then uh, they could generate a cracks like a something like length of 5 mm uh, width of the crack around 0.2 mm and depth of crack 0.5 mm. So, here whether they were uh, question comes whether they were able to reproduce using the software and thus they that is that is what that they have shown uh, length 5 mm they are able to produce uh, you, you can see here that this line they are able to produce a length completely in this case. And then uh, what they mentioned that if the length is increasing then, then, then this trapezoid length is increasing then what will happen uh, if it is increasing that indicates the crack is a longer uh, maybe say whatever the in this case it has been shown 5 mm it will be 7 mm naturally trapezoidal length of the breadth will increase and then uh, and it can be indicated very clearly in that crack has gone beyond certain this limit and then we need to take a necessary action. So, in my view the eddy current uh, testing is very useful uh, uh, and the most of the materials are the conductive materials of course, as a if there is a some sort of a thin coating of oxide or maybe some sort of oil or some other contamination there will be need of a change of the calibration constant and then once we are familiar with the system after that this can be utilized for the longest surface life also. Now, um, then the, that was a shown for the one material and now and the same author uh, they did uh, for the two other also in one case uh, specimen uh, they use uh, uh, 
uh, the crack of the different width and the different width is something like a 0.1 mm and 0.2 mm and then the, the, they made also the second specimen where they made a more number of cracks and uh, in first case uh, the length was only 5 mm in second case uh, they made a 3 mm 5 mm uh, 7 mm 9 mm 11 mm so five different cracks and then uh, this is uh, what has been mentioned two specimen with a crack a uh, varying size they were evaluating because to calibrate and to establish that whatever the method they have developed it is really useful and the, the, the particularly simulation algorithm is also accurate. So, what is the material they use aluminum alloys they were 7075 aluminum alloy and uh, conductivity has been shown as a 18.5 uh, milli uh, the cement per meter and then uh, the, 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 the dimension of the crack has been the dimension of overall specimen has been mentioned 250 by 250 by 20 mm. However, at second um, and the, the specimen the thickness has been reduced to the 10 mm instead of 20 mm. And then uh, the crack 1 and crack 2 has been also mentioned as I say 0 0.1 mm uh, is a 1 crack and the crack 2 is a 0.2 mm while coming to the 5. Uh, cracks uh, they vary the only the length they kept a depth and breadth same 0.2 mm and 1 mm and you can see the simulation results uh, and the we can do a more simulation where the, the increment decrement can be done however these uh, the experimental results are showing with the red color uh, star uh, the, the results have been shown and then they say that whatever they have generated that is really uh, giving good results. So, mathematical models are important. Of course, uh, mathematical modeling uh, cannot be done completely in this course. We will try to give a very simple uh, relation so that we can have a better understanding. But um, every every system will require a different kind of mathematical model, and even the situation need to be accounted. All all the variable need to be accounted. That's why more and more experiments will be required, but not infinity. And then uh, a simulation, uh, if you are able to reproduce the experimental result that can be frozen. So, uh, we need to have a first understanding then uh, choosing a particular situation then those kind of experiment can be done maybe some iteration and finally, results will come out that will be more sustainable will provide a good sustainable solution to us. Now, we talk about the normal case now what will happen in case of the corrosion. So, in uh, my previous lecture I mentioned the corrosion whenever there is a corrosion there will be the weight loss and weight gain also both need to be considered and that has been shown here uh, in this in the figure A has been shown there is an electromagnetic coil there is a steel surface and then uh, there is a maybe some sort of coating in between also there is a possibility some sort of air gap that is what has been shown over here air gap. Now, what is the second case it has been shown then there is a possibility of corrosion. Now, whenever there is a possibility of corrosion the thickness will increase if the thickness is increasing naturally the depth will change and uh, we need to predict that, that there is a depth is changing which is very rare case and something maybe there is a corrosion. So, that is an indication and then of course, um, um, thermal conductivity also will uh, sorry electric conductivity also will change magnetic permeability also will change. So, those parameters need to be accounted and another thing is that these materials are porous. Um, and the corrosive materials are porous compared to the steel surface naturally that porosity will also be need to be accounted. Now, in the third figure the C figure it has been shown that material has been removed and then uh, there is a material loss. In B we have shown the material gain in the C we are showing the material uh, loss and here uh, to predict uh, and then the modeling can be done uh, as a media or uh, maybe air or it can be infinite th thickness or uh, small thickness or the real thickness can be accounted. So, there are 4 figures in the 4 A B C D has been shown. So, what we are saying in um, and then the A it we are showing uncorroded steel B corrosion with a thickness increase C corrosion with a metal loss and then uh, and the D corrosion has been replaced by air that means, we are trying to take air property with a modified uh, conductivity uh, and then permeability as such. So, if I uh, the, 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 I try to explain this, but you say there is uh, in the steel 
what will happen there is a possibility of iron oxide formation there is a possibility of hydro oxide also in case of the if there is a dry environment no moisture no um, on the water content then iron oxide will be formed however there is a possibility of water water then hydrolysis will occur and hydro oxide will be formed and that has been mentioned in this case now why we are mentioning this reason being there will be change in electromagnetic characteristics because of the corrosive product now just for the example hematite we know that the alpha and, and, uh, phase of uh, iron oxide uh, magnetite is the Fe3O4 and have a more exchange of the electron and uh, magamite uh, is a uh, uh, Fe2O3 uh, these are the kind of uh, product of the steel corrosion and then uh, we coming to the, uh, the hydroxide side we can get a ferrous uh, hydroxide we can get a ferric hydroxide or uh, geothite also we can get in this form now what are the electric characteristics or electromagnetic characteristics change in electromagnetic characteristics what we say the hematite is a kind of a semi conducting material uh, and then and the geothite uh, will have a lesser conductivity compared to hematite even though steel surface is same magnetic permeability should be same but because of uh, presence of uh, oxi oxygen or there is oxide formation or because of presence of the water where the hydroxides are formed the conductivity is changing that is why it is changed that geothite exhibit a lower thermal conductivity compared to hematite. Now magnetite has a higher thermal conductivity reason being it is a more number of electron are getting transferred uh, here Fe3 we go ahead with, uh, compared to Fe2 ions and uh, megamite is a kind of ferromagnetic material uh, and then uh, uh, however the last one which is a magnetite uh, exhibit a kind of permanent magnetism. So, steel is not permanent magnet but magnetite which is a kind of a corrosive product it can act as a permanent magnet and uh, is a ferrimagnet or maybe weak permanent magnet is not a neodymium iron boron kind of uh, permanent magnet is a weak magnet is but it will be retainability will be there. So, the kind of the sensor which we are trying to use it will be different and then we see that uh, this uh, iron oxide and hydroxide are lesser dense naturally the again the properties will change uh, and the, these are lesser dense compared to the, in the pure steel and then uh, another possibility is that uh, volume will increase and then uh, we because of the water absorption because of oxygen absorption. So, the layer thickness will going to change now initially the corrosion layer will thicken it and uh, over the time it will thin down. So, increase in the thickness decrease in the thickness. So, when we are using this kind of techniques we need to account all those factors we should not say oh suddenly what is really happening these are the kind of characteristics if we know the mechanics mechanisms of the and then the various process we can really uh, understand and we can uh, go hard with the uh, as I say that when the, when the development of software or development of the code which will can which can incorporate all those things. However, in this case they use a pulse uh, eddy current uh, instead of AC current as such and then uh, uh, as I mentioned it requires a response according to the conductivity right conductivity of the material need to be accounted permeability also need to be accounted and material thickness need to be accounted if you want a uh, really right results. Now, uh, and then uh, we come up with uh, uh, second example uh, on uh, corrosive testing as such we say that um, how do you how do you calculate early stage uh, corrosion as the thickness increases that is the, these are the questions will uh, the, the performance of a steel sample differ if they are coated. If I provide some coating on the surface and try to reduce the corrosion or uh, try to reduce oxide formation will it work and that too in a sea environment in marine environment and uh, finally, when that is in the, the test was carried out finally, they have said no even the coating on the coated surface is not able to prevent a uh, marine environment situation. So, this is uh, what they um, mentioned and then of course, uh, they made all the plate uh, samples and the, the reference has been uh, has been taken from this uh, 2012 publication where they say the steel corrosion characterization using the pulse eddy current system that is what uh, they have done they use a mild steel samples uh, and some of the sample uh, they did a uncoated sample were record, uh, coated and then um, uh, just to avoid the kind of atmospheric uh, corrosion and other samples uh, to, uh, to really get atmospheric corrosion they expose 
to for the 1 month time, 3 month time, 6 month time, 10 month time and the table has been shown that for the uncoated cases uh, and uncoated with a covered with a some sort of paint to prevent the corrosion and coated surface as such. So, they, take a, they took a couple of examples and, uh, uh, and they try to figure out what happens over the time when uh, uh, the corrosive environment is there and how eddy current will really give a response to that. And then uh, they generated uh, some magnetic field currents uh, on, on, on the curves. So, you can see here the P V has been uh, pre uh, presented in a, on a vertical side and then uh, horizontal there is a exposure time and then you are able to see that this curve is continuously increasing where there is uncoated where there is a coated. So, coated and uncoated are near they are not really showing much significant difference and then what is the P V? P V is a maximum difference uh, uh, and then the, 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 del, is the del B norm and how do we calculate the del B norm is basically normalized values and the V and the B whatever the, the signal which is coming and then and the B reference in the such uh, whatever the signal uh, they have taken from a non corroded and B is been corroded uh, signal and then the, the, the del B is basically difference into the uh, signal which has been from a corroded surface and then a non corroded surface the difference between the signals and then to, to normalize these signals they divided for maximum value of B uh, with the maximum value of B. So, it is a lesser than 1 similarly B ref also is lesser than 1 that is why we are getting very low value on the vertical axis. But we are finding that with exposure of time this value is continuously increasing, but it is no prevention of the corrosion it is continue the corrosion is continuously increasing as such. And then uh, second case uh, the response is continuously coming down uh, the eddy current is giving very low response even the maximum that is what has been shown here with exposure of time. So, then the exposure uh, the response of B is continuously decreasing. So, B reference and non reference. Uh, when the B coated and no uh, coating, uh, we do not find much variation in B and then uh, um, the, the over the time because of the corrosive layer response will come down and that has been shown. However, absolute difference the, when they, they are trying to do a difference that is a continuously increasing. Now, coming to the, um, uh, the corrosion height, uh, the, the, the surface roughness which will continuously increase because of corrosion because of the accumulation of the material or the surface or because of the corrosive uh, porous material. And they also found that in micron size the weather time that the, the, the layer is continuously increasing corrosive layer continuously increasing and everything is possible with the uh, eddy current testing itself. And in reality you can see the photographs after 3 months there is a corrosive layer on a sample and this has a increased significantly spread has increased and then uh, we are able to see the loose particle keep coming out flaking off off also and then a further increase. So, what we are able to see with the naked eyes and then the eddy current also gives a similar kind of response. This does not mean that we, we, we why we are using eddy current uh, testing mostly we, we require a testing calibration. So, that when we are not able to reach to the surfaces we are not able to see uh, and, then, and then eddy currents can give a closed system response also uh, surfaces which we are not able to see or surfaces below and then the, there is a subsurface crack same thing must be happening if the crevices corrosion is happening the same process will occur there also and eddy current can give a response in naked eyes or maybe visual and the visual technique will not be able to help us. So, from that point of view I can say the eddy current testing is a good tool and then should be utilized and there is a there are more and more chances of opening company and uh, getting better and better results because this kind of uh, testings are continuously required even if we want to do some innovation want to change a material uh, change a process or change um, the utilize the same material for new application this kind of testing will build a confidence it will really give a good results to us. So, what we are saying the correlation between the pulse EC property and exposure duration uh, need to be established of course, uh, this author have established and that is why they are showing uh, and it of course, it can change material to material. So, what they have a given relation not necessarily will be a same for every material, but this is a kind of initiation it gives us some sort of exposure that is a there is a strong relation and if we are able to calibrate if we are able to find then um, another week we can develop this kind of technique. 
So, this is a useful uh, um, uh, we can estimate uh, the, the relation is known the future corrosion rate estimation is possible and uh, many times even early detection of crack can be uh, identified or we can evaluate well in advance. Now, this is what we have covered for the eddy current uh, based testing. Now, we are trying to cover the second testing that is a TT. Uh, and basically, we do not use the word uh, infrared here. Of course, that overall technique name is infrared thermography testing. However, in bracket, I am writing TT because short form it is known as TT testing as such. And now, what we do in this test it is again same kind of uh, take an image and do analysis. Uh, in, in this situation, we use infrared cameras to detect and see distribution of temperature. Now, why we are giving a temperature distribution um, emphasis reason being that um, and the, the, uh, with the heat infrared will come out and with the naked eye we cannot judge, we cannot observe, but with the camera we can capture, we can analyze that and that is the overall test technique. So, in this case we use infrared cameras to detect and see distribution of temperature across the surface of object. Now, in this case camera captures. Uh, infrared radiation which is emitted from a surface and then uh, because we are not able to see the infrared uh, radiation what a camera does it changes to the color and then they give a color coded image or sometimes use a word thermal mapping and thermal mapping we can see. So, from invisible thing they this camera gives visible things some to us and then even though it is an indirect measurement but we can get a kind of good correlation with that and we know that there is a principle that every object having temperature above uh, absolute 0 will emit infrared radiation and as the temperature increases uh, IR radiation will in increase continuously and we as I mentioned the human eye cannot see IR radiation uh, and then that is why there is a need to convert this radiation into something which we can see and that is why this uh, the, this technique convert to the thermal map or color coded images. Now, what are the correction factors which we are required? Naturally again that there is an environmental temperature coming, so compensation difference will be required. Emissivity of the object again uh, will be important, emissivity of the object will be different. Many times uh, these kind of uh, products are uh, the painted with a black color, so the emissivity increases. And another thing is that what is the distance between the camera and object, lesser the distance better the results, but we cannot and there is something rotating we cannot keep a camera directly in contact with the surface. Actually, we need to keep a some distance and what is the distance uh, what that difference will uh, bring there is signal actually we need to work on the difference in a signal not an absolute signal. Another thing as I say that uh, this infrared thermography can uh, detect the anomalous anom uh, 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 the variation in a heating pattern, misalignments and damaged components uh, if there are uh, particularly mechanical system or uh, if there is a some sort of uh, difference in material those can be you know uh, uh, can seen if there are cracks or uh, there is a some sort of pores or there are some sort of voids in a surface those also can be seen uh, instead of really going for fracturing it and then looking at the SEM and all uh, instead of that within a surface whatever the anomalous uh, uh, things are coming uh, we need to uh, can ident we can identify it. Even the motor uh, some sort of friction is a higher side more bearings uh, shaft is not able to rotate in a motor properly we can detect the bearing bearings are misaligned at some point uh, the temperature in the higher side some point the temperature is the lower side side we can figure out or if there is a some sort of a leakage uh, maybe you know, the, the, the even the liquid is leaking out we can identify it with uh, this kind of uh, thermographs also. Now, thermal imagers can visualize the surface temperature and one, uh, one important point is that often we feel that um, um, thermal image can give a complete uh, uh, shape. No, it is not it is gives only the temperature variation it can really map the temperature but it cannot really map the complete organ or complete object or something like a complete system as such. So, there is a possibility of some difference in this uh, even the word is image it does not mean that this camera is able to see able to find the uh, uh, infrared radiation and convert infrared radiation to the thermal map. So, we find only thermal maps 
we do not find real object as such. So, it is an odd image as such however, we are using the word thermal imaging and uh, visualization from that point of view. So, camera cannot see inside it can only give a thermal uh, thermography. Now, how, how this uh, infrared uh, thermography works it is very simple we say that uh, and then the we, we throw infrared uh, to the object, object can be even human body as such and then uh, we find some sort of uh, thermal mapping and then thermal mapping can be given uh, this kind of. So, this, this, uh, this is what I was trying to say even though image is something like that, but I will get a thermograph something like this. So, it is not a replica, it is not a real photograph, it is a thermal image and you are well aware that even in the COVID time we use uh, this kind of cameras extensively to find out what is the temperature of the body and then whether the person has a high temperature or low temperature something like it was done. But we know also that this, this kind of camera really uh, and then the give a different kind of results. If the a low cost uh, camera we buy it will give a very bad results also, but we go with the costly cameras it will give a good results. We need to know understand what are the parameters and how many more parameters are there, what are the, and then the kind of the software which are really being utilized. So, many times hardware cost will not be that much as a software cost and that is that is an important thing that in recent time we require more and more sophisticated uh, modeling and, and uh, software compared to the hardware. Of course, uh, hardware also need to be improved uh, and the testing need to be improved data need to be uh, and then the, uh, obtained to go ahead with a data driven approach as such. So, however, these are the very uh, well known uh, examples uh, which are uh, use a thermal imaging and then what is uh, really done in this case it is also says it detect uh, infrared emitted from objects whatever the every object will emit uh, ob and then the infrared. Of course, so first uh, we are throwing some sort of uh, spectrum uh, and the maybe some sort of light and then here which is shown that um, and then the infrareds are coming from uh, this person and getting captured on the camera and then the final display is coming as a thermal mapping of the system. Same thing uh, has been mentioned over here and then finally, we get image. So, we, we can uh, elaborate in manner say infrared uh, light emitted uh, by the object. Um, it is generally captured by the focus lens and then uh, it has been it is generally scanned by the number of uh, uh, detectors infrared detector or array of the detector what we call use the word the phase array and here the ma ma maximum difference comes if the phase array or detectors are very good uh, then the cost will be also an increased side on higher side. And then uh, this detector elements uh, which are captured the, in the infrared radiation and then they can create a thermograph. So, this is uh, important if the lenses are good or maybe the and then the phase array is good then we can get a better and better results. And then of course, this thermograph uh, also which is getting it can be colored coating, but it can be converted to the thermal impu into the electrical impulses and then uh, we can do a signal uh, and then the conditioning or signal processing of uh, those things and we can improve the uh, quality of image as such. So, that is what has been mentioned and then uh, we see that uh, and then the, there will be number of impulses and then combination of impulses need to be analyzed properly to generate a final thermal image. So, again there are many subunits in between signal processing need to be very good in this case if the uh, we do not have a good uh, filters or good uh, signal processing units there then we will not be able to get a very good results. So, again uh, it can be very uh, uh, almost negligible cost uh, 30,000, 40,000 rupees or it can be very costly if you like rupees it can go even to about 10 lakh. So, this thermal imaging uh, will have a number of features again it is very important to uh, come up with a um, better and better tools which is which are really required. Uh, reason being that we can uh, capture complete uh, thermal image from uh, some distance and then we can uh, really predict very fast results because there is a screen and we are able to get a, uh, either digital data here which we are showing the digital data uh, kind of uh, thing or maybe instead of thermal imaging we are doing getting a converting this in electrical signals or Im electrical impulses and then we are converting to the units. Now, uh, the, the, I, I just wanted to cover one example of the gears and then um, um, uh, reason being in these days 
um, we want lighter and lighter material, lighter and lighter uh, um, and the components so that uh, the better and better results can be achieved and then we have a lesser and lesser losses and uh, particularly like in automobiles or uh, aircraft industry. If you go with a lighter weight uh, products naturally it will give a, a faster uh, better results efficiency better but it will also cause a more and more failure also. So, if we are able to predict the failures well in advance we can do a good optimization. So, this case study is basically for that purpose and this case study we have picked up from a 2022 literature what they did they, they used the experimental investigation on a crap propagation path in a spur gears and you can see this is a spur gear and they made a three kind of a spur gear gear 1, gear 2, gear 3 and then in all three uh, they have kept the pitch circle diameter same width of the gear also same 22 and the number of teeth also same model also same what has been changed they change the rim thickness they change uh, an MB they change MW and then they change the CR and what is the uh, MB and there is a backup ratio they use a lesser dimension for the rim you say lay on a rim dimension related to the tooth height. The tooth height is same because modules and all are the same in this case the tooth height remains same however when we are thinking about MB uh, as a 1 so that means a, uh, there is a 1 relation and uh, when we are thinking of the MB as a 0.3 or 0.5 naturally that rim dimension has come down a decrease in this case. Now uh, of course they, they analyze 1 and 3 uh, oh sorry 1 and 2 because uh, this is the worst case 0.3 and this is the uh, best case. And then if the results are uh, known to us then we can interpret also be another gear 3 also however in the uh, I am going to give a results of 1 and 2 only. Now this is uh, in this MW in this case is a web ratio they again give it the web thickness so related to the face width however they have kept a 10 percent point one only. So that the naturally then in this case uh, they are trying to reduce the uh, weight of this per gear significantly so that uh, they can predict what is really going to happen with that and of course uh, their aim was to come up with a fail safe design what is a fail safe design uh, if the design even fail it should inform us so the necessary correction action can be taken. So that is why I say that if the failure occurs it should be safe failure rather than catastrophic failure if it is then that is a fine and then uh, there is a as I mentioned there is a continuous pressure on the weight reduction uh, that is why that they reduce the uh, thickness they reduce the web ratio also and then backup uh, ratio and these are important for uh, any any mobile industry uh, aerospace automobiles that is why they, they try to make a gear with a thin rim and what is the problem with a thin rim see if there is a subsurface crack if there is a thick um, in the rim then crack propagation will take a longer path but if there is a thin naturally even a small crack can immediately reach to the uh, surface. So, it will have a much lesser distance to travel and then there is a possibility of the failure in that situation. So, this is what we say the propagation of fracture to the fracture will be much faster in thin section and that is why they are more probable to go for the catastrophic failure and it should not happen. So, what we say the fail safe failure happens when the crack propagates through the tooth in the case particularly they found that if the tooth is only fractured then there is no problem as such. But if the fracture on the crack is start from a tooth and it reaches to the shaft surface or the inside something crack is start from here it moves to the inside then then the, the, there is a possible the catastrophic failure is possible. So, that they wanted to avoid that if the fracture happens it should happen on the this surface or kind of the this surface it should not go inside this. So, again uh, and this is a not a normal kind of failure is a basically intensive bending failure when there is a kind of a jamming a very high torque is applied very high load is applied on a gear tooth then this kind of bending failure will occur normal corrosion wear on the pitting wear or the gear wear will not uh, cause this kind of failure but extensive bending load as I say that when there is a lot of jamming action or some sort of you know, scissor then that kind of action will occur. Uh, or maybe suddenly very high torque comes or very high load comes then this kind of failure comes. However, we want we are trying to figure out uh, how the infrared thermography will work. So, then this example is good to explain that 
and then we see if the, there is a fail safe site it can really give uh, well an advance notification on and can the maintenance can be taken in appropriate manner. Uh, however, there are continuous as I mentioned that um, there is a continuous uh, train to go for better and better material we go for the better and better inspection and then if we know well in advance we have a good tools or mathematical tools or uh, simulated data or maybe the experimental data then uh, we can go for the better maintenance practice also. So, this is example is for related to that and then uh, what they did they use a kind of fatigue testing machine where uh, bending uh, related tests were performed and then uh, they, they had an inbuilt uh, punch to impact pulse loading on a gear tooth. So, it was not a real gear mashing it was hammering the gear so that uh, there is a failure of the gear tooth and then they showed this uh, kind of uh, thing. So, this is kind of a fail safe uh, and then the kind of the cracks are going to develop in the this side only. So, that the failure will occur according to this and then they feel that a removal of the one gear tooth is a fail safe side. However, the crack is initiated over here you can see crack here and if proper and the appropriate inside then that is a disadvantage. So, that is why they wanted to avoid and then uh, they found when they are making a thin uh, uh, the rim then the, the crack propagation happens to the, uh, the surface and the to the uh, root side or inside of towards the rim which is uh, not correct. So, that is why the corrective actions are required. So, I am just explaining that what they have done they use a, a thermo camera to monitor the heat profile on the surface uh, tooth root fillet zone. So, they knew exactly where the crack is going to initiate it because using the pulse load uh, loading and then they were using the punch and impacting only only the one kind of surface. So, they knew, knew exactly where the crack is going to initiate. So, they could fix a camera there and observe how the crack is getting, getting initiated how the crack is progressing and uh, maybe the, the gear 2 the crack was progressing towards the inside while uh, in, in, in the gear 1 it was progressing towards the tooth removal side. So, tooth removal is ok and for them and uh, uh, crack propagation inside is not correct. So, in this case the both the gear reference uh, and the reference specimen because as I mentioned atmospheric temperature is also important because we are looking at only that the temperature difference. So, the both the whatever the reference they might choose the material and the, the gear materials they use in the both gear and reference material they spread the black paint and to so that the uh, emissivity comes closer to the 0.95. So, more and more uh, uh, emissivity of the material it will be giving a better and better signal no to noise ratio it will give a, a precise uh, temperature measurement or precise temperature reading as such. And then uh, this is about figure 5 they have shown left image is related to gear 1 this is what I mentioned here uh, you can see the failures coming here, but it is a kind of ductile failure and it is a crack is propagating to the uh, to the tooth failure side it is not going to the rim side while uh, in this case uh, on the, the right hand side it is progressing inside to the rim. So, that is they do not want this is what they have tried to show and then uh, we say that uh, this uh, thermograph uh, uh, to monitor the surface temperature profile uh, uh, during the bending test they use it and then uh, the what they collected is something like a surface heat map. Uh, which can really indicate where is a discontinuity in a crack. So, that discontinuity uh, in a crack was identified it is shown here something like a crack here of course, uh, my pan color and the tooth color is same. So, that is why it is getting much uh, and then another thing is that if you want uh, some sort of innovation design in material this kind of approaches are important um, this kind of experiments are important. So, uh, we will continue um, in the, this uh, the non destructive uh, testing topic in our next lecture and probably uh, we will complete this uh, non destructive testing in uh, lecture 20th. Thank you.